I go way back uh, to the 1950s beginning of all this with Yogananda. Uh, my first beginning was I was a high school student at LA High, uh, and I went to a lecture uh, in the streets of just what is now Koreatown in LA, uh, and heard a brother Bhaktananda who was uh, part of the Self-Realization Fellowship. And he emanated a kind of mindfulness and peace that I'd never encountered with a teacher. I mean, he, he really embodied what he was talking about, and his, he had a sense of presence where all the other high school teachers and people I had met were uh, mental, you know, busy energy. And I was really impressed. And, um, and so I became aware of, uh, you know, SRF and Yogananda bringing yoga from India, in, you know, in the first wave, way back, got back in the 20s or something. So growing up in the streets of LA, LA being a city on the Pacific Rim interfacing uh, with uh, all of those Asian cultures from Japan and, and uh, China, I, um, I became aware of the kind of the waves of planetization. And What's became, that word, planetization? Planetization is a word from Teilhard de Chardin, right. a book on the future of mankind. And so the planetization uh, was something I bumped into because I was growing up in a big... Uh, urban environment on the Pacific Rim. Uh, so I didn't come at it from Brooklyn or New York. I got it from L.A. But this is L.A. in the 50s when, you know, it was the Marilyn Monroe top-down convertible Santa Monica Beach era. Uh, so it was, you know, being at the right place at the right time. And so uh, that made a big impression on me. And I started reading the Upanishads and stuff in high school and, and getting really interested. Uh, and then went, you know, get busy on the academic thing and took a, you know, a right turn into getting a BA and PhD at Pomona and then Cornell. And then finally, when I got back to Cambridge and teaching at MIT, then I had time to take a left turn back to esoteric uh, matters, uh, and so I went to the SRF ashram and the beautiful lake out in Malibu on Sunset Boulevard, and then started taking the Kriya Yoga lessons of, uh, of Yogananda. That's a three and a half year course in traditional Shaivite, you know, uh, esoteric yoga, and it's pretty much what you know, a lot of people teach, you know, the elevation of Kundalini, the initiation through the etheric body. So it's illumination, not enlightenment, you know, it's definitely using the etheric body as the vehicle of initiation, which from a, let's say, Buddhist or even Catholic point of view, that's not compassion, that's not enlightenment, that's not, you know, the biggie, it's just illumination. And so those people who stop there can be spiritually arrogant, spiritually cruel. Uh, you know, then they're definitely not there yet. And that's why a lot of the gurus were screwed up. You know, I had then in the 60s, I, I met Muktananda, and he was messing around with women, and he was doing shakti pot. And all of that stuff doesn't mean shit. You know, it's, uh, it's all the etheric body. But a lot of people, you know, thought it stopped there and, and made a big deal out of Muktananda. And, you know, Trumpa was doing his thing and there was a lot of, a lot of noise from, I met Trumpa and, and I, so I met a lot of these guys. And um, some of them were really screwed up, you know, like Trumpa was an alcoholic and, and people would talk about crazy wisdom and they would rationalize to hold on to their holy man, but the holy man was uh, more noise than information, so I was very unsatisfied with that. More noise than information, what, what does that mean? Well, that's information theory from Shannon, that uh, a message is information plus noise and the signal. So if you have a muddy channel, then you have more noise than information. 
if you have a good clear channel, then you have more information than noise. Right. I, I like that metaphor because, you know, it, it is relevant to everyday people could understand that. And I think um, I want to hear more about your process, but I think there's a lot of noise in today's society. And we can talk about that a little later. I, I actually uh, got Shaktipad from uh, Mutgananda the last weekend he was in, in, uh, in the U.S., up, upstate. Yeah, I got it on the Upper uh, East Side with Ira Friedlander, the guy who wrote the book on the Whirling Dervishes on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. When I'm at MIT and it's the 60s, you know, and the counterculture is really happening. Uh, and I was never into uh, drugs, but my friends and I've never owned a nickel bag or owned a joint, you know, I, I accepted a roach at parties in the 60s. I think I smoked grass twice. Um, and that was just tokes. Uh, so I took a token. and I had my head in the stereo speaker listening to the doors break on through to the other side. <laughs> and then my third eye started swirling with this um, vortex. And a voice came in and said, get the hell out of here, you drugstore mystic, and come in the right way. And so I, you know, listened to that daimonic prompting and uh, would have nothing to do with the, the counterculture drug scene. You know, I met Alpert and um, what, what was his name change? Uh, Dick Is Albert. There? Dick Albert became what? Uh, he had um, a, Ram Dass. Yeah, Ram Dass. I met him. Uh, I went to a lecture in the East Village, I think, with um, Timothy Leary. And I was really turned off by the scene, by him, by their vibes. And I had a repulsion to the psychedelic uh, subculture. Uh, I didn't want any part of it. And because I had been exposed as a high school student, back uh, circling to, to brother uh, Bhaktinanda, I um, began to be interested in, you know, pure yoga and doing it the right way as the voice instructed. So when I was out in LA, when I was still teaching at MIT, I went for a walk around the Self-Realization Fellowship Lake in, uh, in uh, Malibu or whatever part of uh, LA it's in. And from that, connected to the, the Kriya Yoga and started doing Kriya Yoga, which takes three and a half, hour, uh, three and a half years to go through the whole trip. And, um, and that got me really interested in the authentic counterculture and not the druggy one. So when I... Was there overlapping between the authentic counterculture and the druggy one? No, there was just repulsion to the drug scene uh, and even, even grass uh, for me. I never, uh, I always had a daimonic feeling that LS, my friends were doing uh, acid and SCP and some other stuff and mushrooms. And, and I knew sort of intuitively that that was not the way I wanted to go. So I went into the yogic training and then that practice of doing that, um, I came to, uh, you know, the usual countercultural crisis of MIT with the Vietnam War and became dissatisfied that MIT was like the thought police of the military industrial complex and being an MIT professor was like being Muzak in the factory. And so I quit, uh, even though they promoted me twice in the three years I was there. Um, and I and actually now think it was a mistake. I should have stayed at MIT. But I went up to this brand new university in Toronto called York University, which was supposed to become the Santa Cruz of Canada, but it it never did. And but in the very first days in 1968, it was full of promise and idealism, wow. And wow. innovation, and we were you know. And so I was part of that. And then when when I was in Canada. I went to the summer conferences of the Canadians called the Kuchichin Conference on Lake Kuchichin one summer, maybe 69, and I met Ivan Illich. And he blew me away. He was the most charismatic speaker I'd ever heard. 
And this one was when Ivan was really hot. He was writing Deschooling Society and all these articles for the New York Review of Books. And, and uh, he articulated with his CDOC the countercultural institution, the individual as, as institute. So I wrote a cover article for Harper with that title, The Individual as Institution and looked at these various uh, people who had split from the scene and set up <coughs> their own shop, and I decided that was the way I wanted to go. So I quit the university and set up Lindisfarne and came down from you know, Toronto to Manhattan, first setting it up in the Hamptons and then moving to the church on the corner of 6th, uh, in the 70s, on the corner of 6th Avenue and uh, 20th Street. Right, right, right. So when was that that you set, set up shop in Manhattan? Um, I moved, I think, in 1973 down and had the first to Ham uh, Southampton, the Hamptons, and had the first Lindisfarne conference that brought all these diverse people who expressed planetization together. So I had E. of Schumacher and Stuart Brand and Carl Sagan and you know I had about 20 of those guys so it it uh, was a big scene and so it got an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine and uh, you know uh, uh, Bill Moyers did an hour TV program on me and Lindisfarne uh, that was Lindisfarne in Manhattan but the first from 74 to 76 we were out in the Hamptons in 1976, we uh, got the property in Manhattan. Uh, they, it was an underused church that had died. It was, you know, the church in which the Easter parade first happened in Manhattan. So uh, at one time, it was the scene, but it, that era had passed and it was left and the Episcopal Church wanted to get rid of it because it was a drain on them. So we got it for a dollar a year lease. Wow. Yeah. And Chelsea, of course, boomed later. If I could have stayed in Manhattan and kept that scene and had uh, uh, the conference center in the Hamptons and the urban center in Manhattan, that would have been perfect. But that takes a lot of money. And well, I was wondering how, how you pulled it off, but a dollar a year, I mean, that's affordable. <laughs> yeah, that's affordable. But the program to run it, you know, I had at the beginning grants from the Lilly Endowment Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Lawrence Rockefeller came to one of my lectures at uh, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. It might have been the one you were uh, in. So uh, the Village Voice wrote an article about, hey, get your lifestyle, and talked about hippies and Rockefellers, you know, in the same audience listening to me. And Lawrence invited me to lunch the uh, next day and um, said, would you like some money? And so he became my patron. And so with that money, I started my program. But eventually in Manhattan, you know, you get $50,000, you spend it on the programs, and, and you're broke, you know. So it's, they don't give you money for an endowment because they don't want to have a dependent. You know, there are rules that the rich have about their philanthropy. And the number one rule is don't make dependents. You know, just give them to empower them and then back off. And so they did that. And with it, I had, you know, a very dynamic program for three years, and then it went bust. As right, and then, and then I, I remember I recorded you up at Synod House, and yeah. that was, must have been, I didn't graduate college till the 80s, so it must have been like 83, 84, 82. Oh, that's much later, yeah, because uh, during the time, Jim Morton got interested because when he became dean in 75, he didn't, he, he had grown up in the Black South Civil Rights Movement uh, when the, his white elitist class, you know, uh, tried to help the afflicted blacks in the South and in, in the Civil Rights Movement. And so with the environmental movement, though he became Green Dean, he hadn't a clue about ecology. And suddenly he comes to my meetings out in, uh, in the Hamptons and he meets John Todd and he meets, you know, all these uh, ecologists and uh, appropriate technology people and gets totally turned on by that. 
And when I look at the group, I realize uh, that I needed to make it more permanent, so I created the Lindisfarne Fellows. And I think he became a Lindisfarne Fellow in 75, and then he invited me to become an honorary colleague, which is like the secular equivalent of being a canon, since I wasn't a clergyman, I couldn't be a canon. And so he and the Bishop Paul Moore made me uh, an honorary colleague of the cathedral, and I started uh, giving a course of lectures that you attended in uh, in the 80s. Yeah, we recorded them. We, we did the audio recordings, and uh, I think it was David Spangler and... Yeah, a whole bunch of people, yeah. Yeah, and so that was in the 80s, and I, uh, since I couldn't... Uh, I was no longer in Canada. I couldn't afford to live in Manhattan uh, because it's just so expensive. You so expensive. Rich. Yeah. And so I was living in Bern with my Swiss wife and commuting uh, to do a season of talks at, at the cathedral. And um, that worked for, you know, a couple of years. And like right. everything, there's a... To everything there is a season, and so that was my season at the cathedral. Now there's a new dean, and I have absolutely nothing to do with it. Right, 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 right.